Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 42, page 810. It has a title called Retaliation in my Bible. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. We'll go to our Lord in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this wonderful opportunity to go before your glorious throne on behalf of your people, Lord God. Seeing you, Lord Jesus, and knowing your holiness and your righteousness and knowing that we are a rebellious people. And yet, instead of coming at us with a hammer, Lord God, you sent your Son and your grace and mercy to forgive us of our sins and bring us back to yourselves. Your wonderful example, Lord God, of laying down your life for us. I pray, Lord Jesus, that this grace and this mercy that you have bestowed on us, we will be able to bestow on others in our families, with our friends, at work, in our lives, Lord God. I ask for your mercy and grace that you would forgive us for our grudges, Lord Jesus, and help us, Lord Jesus, to respond in your grace and your mercy and truly exhibit that we are your children by loving, Lord God. I ask all this in your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. In the 1870s, food was scarce in the Appalachian region, and a full-grown razorback pig provided a great deal of food for a family. Or if you had enough, you could use that razorback to acquire flour or sugar or coffee or even shoes for your children, because a fat, plump pig was a mainstay for a mainstay for a family struggling to survive in the harsh wilderness. In the winter of 1878, Randall McCoy's prized razorback went missing. Concerned for the loss of such a valuable commodity, he followed the pl- tracks of the pig to and led to Floyd Hatfield's home where he found what he believed to be his pig. Despite the insistence contrary uh, to that of Hatfield. Incensed by the wickedness in the matter, McCoy took it to the local justice of the peace, uh, who created a jury of peers, six Hatfields and six McCoys, to be able to decide the matter of the, of the pig. In the end, McCoy's nephew, Bill Stanton, uh, uh, said the pig belonged to Hatfield, and McCoy lost his pig seven votes to five. Two months later, two McCoys killed Bill Stanton, and the feud turned bloody. For the next 13 years, the feud cost nearly two dozen people their life. Seven men received life in prison. One man was executed. The trials between the Hatfields and the McCoys continued until 1901, with the Supreme Court itself having to intervene. And they were still taking each other to court in the year 2000. This is the Hatfield clan in 1897, and you can see Jane's grandfather. No, just joking. Uh, No relation uh, uh, to the. But you can see our nation's most notorious blood feud between families produced a bitter harvest of murder, hatred, and bitterness all over a stolen pig. Brothers and sisters, I can imagine you might be holding a grudge or have sought revenge over something even less important than a stolen pig in the 1870s. 
silly things and slights and uh, perceived wrongdoing where it bubbles in your heart and you desire revenge and you find subtle ways and not so subtle ways to pour out your punishment on the perpetrator in your mind and also in reality. But this morning, as we come into the Sermon of the Mount, we run full long into Jesus' words. And this morning, I believe, uh, as a representation of the words and the authority of Jesus, is the people of God's kingdom don't seek revenge. They give grace. The people of God's kingdom don't seek revenge. They give grace. My outline this morning will be uh, three things, and I really worked hard to get the R-E in the heart. Um, The revengeful heart, and that's a real word. I looked it up. There's vengeful and revengeful, and we need the the, uh, alliteration here. Uh, A relinquished heart, where I made up that uh, relinquished is normally a verb. It's an adjective now in our church. The relinquished heart. And then finally, we look at the picture of the gospel, a righteous heart. Why? Uh, Do we need this? Because people of God's kingdom don't seek revenge. They give grace. Let's look at the first aspect, a revengeful heart. Revenge really comes natural to the human heart. And it honestly, it's often glorified in our world, in our culture, in movies, in music. Classic uh, novels and stories like the Iliad, both the men and the gods seek revenge. Count of Monte Cristo, uh, the man, his whole life is uh, uh, devoted to, to his enemy. And even Shakespeare gets in on the act with Hamlet. Some of you sing along to the songs of Carrie Underwood. Uh, Maybe next time he'll think before he cheats. A song of revenge. Or uh, for you rockers, Aerosmiths, don't get mad. What? Get even. U.S. history uh, has been popularized in the last few years. Aaron Burr, because of Alexander Hamilton's slight uh, at the nomination of president, where ultimately Jefferson took the nomination over Burr, uh, his whole life Burr spent in getting even with Hamilton until the point in a duel on the shores of New Jersey, uh, Burr gunned down his enemy, Alexander Hamilton. Movie lines. I have a special set of skills, and I will find you, and I will kill you. Or, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Since the beginning of human history, revenge has been a dish served cold. And so as we open up the text this morning, Jesus uh, is quoting from what is known as the Lex Talianos, which has been practiced among ancient people all the way uh, 13 centuries B.C. uh, in ancient pagan people and also the pages of the Old Scripture, of the Old Testament. Notice verse 38. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. The Lex Talianus prevented vigil anti justice, like hillbillies killing each other over stolen pigs. What it did is it limited the type of punishment a person could receive for their crime. And it also limited who was able to uh, be able to execute the crime. Only the state would be allowed to be able to execute the, the, the punishment. A criminal's punishment must not exceed the crime. For example, if the crime resulted in the loss of an eye, the criminal could lose his eye, not his head. And if a, um, uh, a criminal had his, result, uh, his crime resulted in the loss of a tooth, he could pay with his own tooth, not with his life. Thus, justice would be satisfied and evil would be purged from God's people. We see this in Deuteronomy. Uh, the judges shall inquire diligently. So the, the, um, the plaintiff and the defendant would go before the, the jury and the judges and they would diligently look into the cases of the fact. And it said, and later on it says, you shall purge the evil from your midst. The rest shall hear and fear 
and shall never again commit such evil among you. Your eye shall not pity. You shall, it, it shall be a life for life. We see this in the Noadic covenant. Those who take the life of someone else would, uh, could forfeit their own. An eye for an eye, a tooth for his tooth, what Jesus quotes. A hand for a hand and a foot for a foot. However, over time, the law that was given by God to limit retaliation and to prevent revenge while punishing sin was twisted to be the biblical uh, reason and justification for revenge. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, people would demand, because what became the battle cry for their means of satisfying their thirst for revenge and the rationalization that they had for retaliation against the person that did them wrong or they think did them wrong. And therefore, by using this in a way that God did not design, they stacked evil on evil and piled up sin upon sin. Ocean Park, we have to be very careful when we come through that so we don't turn our nose up on the scribes and the Pharisees or the people of the Old Testament or the New Testament for that matter. Because we are just as guilty as them, though our cultural blind spots prevent us from seeing our sin, we can look very um, proudly look down our nose on the sins of other people in other cultures. When someone does us wrong, our natural in inclination far too often is to make them experience our pain. So when someone does us wrong, we go on social media and we unload our frustrations towards them in bitter, ugly, ugly rants. Or we fight fire with fire. We trade insult for insult, slight for slight, attack for attack. We won't throw the first punch literally or metaphorically, but believe me, we're going to fight till we have the last one. When someone hurts us, we throw their faults back in their face and we dredge up the past just so we can make them hurt like we have hurt. It's not always uh, aggressive behavior. Sometimes it's passive aggressive. Uh, sarcasm, subtle digs at a person, or the silent treatment to pay them back, all under the guise of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, or you hurt me, so I'm going to hurt you. We serve as judge, jury, and executioner in our quest for retribution and revenge. Ocean Park, this should never be. Why? Because the people of God's kingdom don't seek revenge. They give grace. We need to put off a revengeful heart and then embrace a relinquished heart. What does that mean? Christians do not demand their rights at the expense of others. We must be prepared as followers of Jesus, to take a lowly position as a humble servant. Jesus, in verse 39, says this, and he gives four different examples of how we uh, um, relinquish our rights in submission to God for the good of our enemy. First thing is this. A relinquished heart is able to overcome insults. Jesus says, but if anyone, at the end of 39, slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. You have to think, think Will Smith and Chris Rock right now, okay? Uh, you're probably familiar with it, Will Smith. Uh, Chris Rock said something ugly about a Will Smith wife. He went up on stage, and rather than punching him in the face... He took his backhand, slapped Chris Rock on the back with the back of his hand uh, as a follow through. It probably hurt Chris Rock, but it hurt his pride much more on millions of people watching that insult unfold. But Jesus is talking more than assault here. 
And he's talking about insults that would lead a person to court. Think contemporary libel on the internet or newspapers or defamation uh, cases. Jesus is telling us that when someone insults us by slapping us in the back, and this was culturally insulting in the first century, and still today, really it is. Not as much, though. In the first century, they could take you to court for doing something like this. But Jesus tells his disciples that to be ready to um, um, uh, endure repeated insults Prepare not to only be hit on the right cheek, but to be ready to receive insults on the next cheek instead of getting even. Refuse, as followers of Jesus and citizens of the kingdom, to return insult, backhand for backhand, or reviling for reviles. Why? Because they trusted in the grace of God. Jesus is telling us Christians can relinquish their right to prosecute those who insult them. Because they know their reputation is secured as child or children of God. Therefore... When the world insults us, we can endure multiple insults without demanding retaliation or demanding and seeking revenge. Second one in verse 40. If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Jesus is not trying to get a bunch of nudists into the kingdom. What he's trying to do is saying that we can overcome injustices that are done to us. The very injustices that the word of God explicitly with the tunics here tells us not to do. The tunic was a basic garment, a long sleeve robe, in a robe. It was akin to a nightshirt that a person wore against their skin. Uh, It was worn short by men, and it was worn long by women. The cloak was the outer garment, and it was an indispensable piece of clothing. In fact, in the Old Testament, there was a law that a person could give their cloak as collateral for something, but they couldn't, the, the insurer could not hold it overnight. They had to give it back to the person because far often the poor would use their cloak as a blanket and a cover up from the elements at night. And it would be immoral and unjust to take the covering of the poor from them uh, in, at night. And so what Jesus is telling us is here, if you're sued for your, for your tunic, far from seeking satisfaction, you can gladly part with what you have a legal demand on. Why? Because your kingdom is secure. Your place is secure in Christ's kingdom by the grace that you have received from God. Injustices in this world... Do not threaten your place in Christ's eternal kingdom. Third, overcome exploitation. Verse 41. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Now, all these things uh, come up a lot. We turn the other cheek, go the extra mile. All of these things have become uh, part of our vernacular in our day and age. But we have to get back, like we're talking in Sunday school, we have to get back into the stand in the shoes and in the glasses of the first century listeners and and readers to be able to understand these things. This verse, Jesus is calling what is called in Roman law as impressment, forced labor, which was common in the Roman world. A civilian could be compelled into doing all kinds of stuff, carrying luggage of the military. They could be forced to do work projects. They could even deliver mail on behalf of the government by law. 
uh, uh, somebody could come up to you and give you a letter and say, take this a mile and bring it to so-and-so's house, and the citizens of the country and the, and would have to do that. Probably one of the most famous examples of impressment that you know of in Scripture is Simon the Cyrene carrying the cross of Jesus. As Jesus is going to Calvary, his body is broken and beaten and tired, and he falls. He cannot carry his cross. And the Roman centurions uh, point to Simon and say, carry his cross. And Simon, who is just uh, uh, standing by, he's witnessing this, is compelled by law or legal exploitation to pick up the cross of Jesus and bring it to Calvary. Impressment, just like unjust lawsuits, invokes outrage. However, the attitude of Jesus' disciples under such circumstances, he calls them not to be spiteful and not to be vengeful, but to be helpful. A member of Christ's kingdom is even willing to go a second mile out of the way when only one mile is required. Why is that? The grace of God compels us to do the unexpected. Even when people are exploiting us and using us. We can sacrifice our rights for others even when we are not legally required to. Because we honor our Christ, our King. And then you have the third one. Our fourth one, excuse me, D. Overcome, you can overcome personal loss. Verse 42. Give to the one who begs from you. Do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You might uh, be aware of the situation when you're walking on the street. Somebody who is down on their luck uh, will come up to you and ask for money for food, for whatever. They might be having, holding a sign that says, I'm, let's be honest, I just want to buy a beer. Don't give that guy the money, uh, but give those who are struggling, who are hungry, who uh, are, are, are um, needy. Even when you think they're probably trying to take advantage of you. Because Jesus here in verse 42 says, the followers are Jesus, are generous you're going to be probably taken advantage of seven times out of ten. But it's for those few people who are down in their luck, who need a helping hand. When they find a member of the the kingdom of God, they're able to receive generously because Christ has been generous to us. I remember one time we had a young couple, probably six or seven years ago, living uh, in a car for a few days in the parking lot. And it had stalled out in the street, and the police wouldn't let them leave it there and sleep in it overnight. So somehow it ended up in our parking lot outside my office window. And there was a young girl there, and I was able to talk to her and her boyfriend and heard their story. And I finally said, what are you doing? You're smart. What are you doing, sleeping in a car? And she told me a little bit of her story, and I said, listen, the church paid for the new part for their car to get it going again because they didn't have money for the part was needed and we got it working and all of that and they left. A few months later, I got a strange request on Facebook that I clicked on it, didn't, but there was a note in there and it was this young lady who said, thank you for helping us in our generosity. Um, He cheated on me and I was like, shocker. Um, She went back to Tennessee, uh, reconciled with her family, found a job. Uh, And I pray that somebody is able to further the grace of the kingdom and tell her of the gospel, which I did at the time. And I knew there was a shot that they were trying to hoodwink me. And I've been hoodwinked many times here before. Uh, Probably I've been too jaded. Um, But ultimately, the end, the people of Christ's kingdom are generous. They don't hoard up their resources of wealth to serve other to serve themselves, but they give from their plenty and many times from their lack to meet the needs of others around them. Followers of Jesus do not simply refrain from evil acts, but they embrace a lifestyle of generous grace. 
They, see, they give of themselves graciously and self-sacrificially, not hoarding their blessing, but seeking to take their blessing and continue it to those who are need at need around them, even when they're not obligated and don't get a tax deduction for doing so. Why? Because grace freely received from Christ in my time of need is freely given to my neighbor in their time of need. Those who, brothers and sisters, have experienced the shocking grace of Jesus respond with shocking grace towards others. Because the people of God's kingdom do not seek revenge, they give grace. Now, there's so much things that I, I, could, I could talk about here, but I just want to take a brief parenthetical thought. And there is a difference between enduring um, and not seeking revenge and seeking biblical justice. Uh, in our world, uh, justice is a hot commodity, and you have uh, two sides that are fighting. One side has one side of justice, the other side has says, and it's, it's an ugly, bitter fight that uh, is leading us nowhere. It's an endless circle. But often, uh, in our world, we can turn our eyes to in genuine biblical or injustices in our world, real sin that's going on, whether it be racism, classism, misogyny, whatever it may be, real genuine injustices in our world. And we see and continually through the scriptures calling us to love mercy, seek justice, walk humbly with our God. And uh, 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 Isaiah, I think it's 117, it says, learn to do good, stop doing evil, seek justice, stop the oppressor, care for the widows and orphans. Uh, biblical justice is not revenge. George Yancey, who is a sociologist at Baylor University, says often the worldly calls for justice in our world are calls for revenge. And we see this where there are oppressors and there are the oppressed. And we lift up the oppressors and what happens because of the depravity of the heart? They start oppressing and that cycle continues. But here's what the gospel says. The gospel says there is real injustice out there. In the civil rights movement of the 1960s, it was the faithful pastors of black churches that were leading people to be able to see the image of God. Signs like, I am a man. I am an image bearer of God. And as Christians, when we see our brothers and sisters being sinned against clearly uh, in Scripture, even when it's inconvenient to us, we should uh, respond to genuine biblical calls to fight injustice. But in our hearts, because we have seen faithfully for the African American church for so many years that they did not have power. And what they did is they appealed to the God of heaven and trusted him to be able to deliver them. And that as we now enter uh, the church into a time when culture is turning against the faithful biblical church, it will be the examples of our brothers and sisters uh, for the last four or five hundred years in the African American church that trusted God, did not respond with revenge, but called on God. And we see his people rose up to get the government to acknowledge and give them uh, and, and to stop sinning against them. And thankfully, uh, many people have faithfully given us that example. There's a difference between revenge and in biblical injustice. That's a sermon for another time. I won't charge anything extra for there. Think about it. Pray about it. If you want to read about it, I have lots of books that I can give you. But here we come to our third point. Um, a revengeful heart, a relinquished heart, uh, and then a righteous heart. 
So what we do here in Matthew uh, is we're going to, in this step, we're going to take a step back to see a bigger picture of how this text in Matthew fits into the bigger picture of uh, trusting in grace of our God and not seeking revenge. Three ways a heart is uh, righteous. Because remember, all of this is under, in uh, Matthew chapter 5, Verse 20, um, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. First, we're called to surrender to Jesus. Surrender to Jesus. When we are wronged, when we're sinned against, when we're slighted, we want that person punished. And we often think that by taking things into our own hands, it'll make us feel better. I'll satisfy my revenge and things will be whole and right again. We couldn't be any more wrong. Psychology Today reports that researchers have found exacting revenge, quote unquote, didn't provide a release that in fact it made participants focus and unruminate about the transgressor and their transgression more, especially if that person had taken revenge themselves. The lust for revenge, brothers and sisters, is a self-made prison where we are victimized over and over and over again. Exacting revenge is not cathartic, it's traumatic. Therefore, Scripture, the God who has designed us and created us and knows what's best for us, how that we can live fullness and full lives calls us to surrender our thirst for revenge to a sovereign and good God. He knows what we need, and he's always working for what's best in his people. In the book of Deuteronomy, we see this uh, call for surrendering our revenge. It says, God is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. Vengeance is mine. And recompense. Therefore, the uh, evildoers, the people, the oppressors, uh, shall slip in due time. The wicked, as Psalm says. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things to come hasten upon them. Bishop Mark, let me tell you this. You do not have the strength, the wisdom, or the perspective to sort through the reality of man's sinful heart, either your enemy's heart or yours. What's wrong? Uh, what was the wrong that was done from hatred? Was it done from brokenness? Was it done from ignorance? Was their motivation pride, shame, jealousy, foolishness, greed, or was it an honest mistake? Do you know all the facts? Are you being deceived? Are you being used? Are you uninformed? You don't have all the answers, and you, we don't have the capacity to observe, observe every action, perceive every thought, and understand every motivation. We're fallible, we're feeble, and we're finite. But God is not. Psalm 139 is a a verse that we often quote to ourselves for comfort. Oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even when a word is on my tongue, behold, oh Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand upon you. And for many of us, that brings us great joy. That should terrify us as well. Because the God, the maker of heaven and earth, who we confess, we believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, knows us. Christopher Watkins, in in one of his books, he says, this is the counsel of despair for those who have set themselves up in opposition to God. There is a witness who walks not only in our public deeds when we have our best faces on, 
but also through the inner landscape of our wounds and thoughts and who in the fullness of time will take the judge's seat and pass verdict on all our secrets. Ocean Park, if you belong to Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation when you stand before the judge. But for those who um, attack you, who smear you, who who oppress you, who um, uh, do wrong towards you, they will stand before the Almighty Judge who will deal with them justly and rightly. Ocean Park, feelings of revenge can be surrendered by realizing a day is coming when God in His perfect wisdom, His perfect knowledge, and His perfect power will make all things right. And he will visit his wrath on all who deserve it. And we can trust him to do what is good and what is just. Far better than we we can. Paul picks up the words of Deuteronomy and says, Behold, never avenge yourselves. Don't return evil for evil. Don't take an eye for an eye. But leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay. The only way to be free from the burden of revenge is to lay your revenge at Christ's feet. Only he is strong enough and wise enough to do what is good and best for you and for your enemy. But let me tell you this. Let me warn you. In chapter 5, it says, Surrender... Your revenge is neither easy, nor is it natural. Let me say it again. Surrendering revenge is neither easy, nor it's natural, but it's absolutely necessary. Now, we're coming up on some text. I thought lust and divorce was hard enough. Forgiveness, loving your enemies, man, those far, far surpass it. Trite sayings like let go and let God make the struggle superficial and misleading. The pain of suffering and injustice may not disappear today, but a future day of vengeance is coming. An eschatological day when good, just, and right vengeance will be doled out. All the way going back into the garden, the blood of Abel cries out. And for those who have experienced injustices and wrongdoing and persecution and suffering from this world, we have a God who does not forget and he hears the cries of your blood and for your suffering and the tears you cried have been held in a bottle. Question is, will you surrender your desire for revenge to our good and sovereign God? Second, will you obey Jesus? The righteous heart obeys Jesus. It's not enough to surrender revenge. Jesus is not telling us to trust the system because the system is just as sinful as the people who created the system. Jesus is telling us to trust him, who is good and just and true. The gospel then, you ready? We surrender our cause to revenge. And rather than pouring out our punishment and hatred and vengeance on our enemy to give to them what they've given us to us, the gospel tells us, no, no, no. No, no, no. Next week, love your enemy. Seek the good of your enemy. That's mind-blowing. That's impossible. And this is why we need the grace of God. Because we can't do this on our own. This is the Pharisees. The best of the best. Unless your righteousness exceeds them. Billy Graham, Mother Teresa, the Pope, the Dalai Lama, whoever, you name it, your grandma, anybody. The most righteous person you know. Filthy rags. Your righteousness must exceed there. You need Jesus because you can't do it. Romans 12, Paul tells us, this is the continuation. Never avenge yourself. The next verse, to the contrary, don't avenge. Leave it to God. Surrender it to God. Contrary says, if your enemy is hungry, you got them. They're starving. Let them just sit in their hunger. No, no. 
Jesus says, feed them. But you don't know what they did to me. Feed them. And if they're thirsty, let them die. Slow and painful death, right? No, no, no. Give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap up burning coals on his head. Now we're like, what in the world? Uh, That sounds passive aggressive. What are you putting in that food? And what are you putting in that water? A little chili powder or something? No. Brothers and sisters, we see this developed a little more next week when love your enemy. But the ethic of kingdom is not to hate your enemy or even avoid your enemy. But we're called to love them and care for them and seek their good. We lay down our right for revenge and seek our enemy's good. Church history is littered with these things. And I, and I wish I had brought some more out. We don't lash out at our enemy. Instead, the Lord commands us to feed our hungry enemy and quench our enemy's thirst. Jesus commands us to seek our enemy's well-being. And it's not uh, the burning coals on their head is not nice, nasty revenge. Oh, which torments and increases guilt. No, we return evil with good that we may prick their conscience and bring them a conviction of sin and repentance to their hearts. Russell Moore, in a recent article in Christianity Today, wrote this. If we are gospel Christians entrusted with the genuinely good news, we call ourselves evangelical, which is the Greek word for good news, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, then our end goal cannot be to win an argument, much less humiliate our opponents. Now again, we have to balance revenge with biblical justice. And, that, and that's, that's a long road that we're talking about. But here, and he gives this, our end goal is to see people reconciled to God and to each other. Success for us isn't defined by getting a successful conviction of our enemies on the day of judgment. You see that? Think about those people. Maybe the libs, maybe the magas, maybe whoever you think are those people who could never receive the grace of God. Your goal is not a successful judgment on them to send them to hell for eternity. Success is their acquittal. Through the blood of Christ. And even more so, their adoption in the family of God. Let me tell you, some of the, one of the most notorious criminals in Scripture was a guy named Saul. Literally persecuting Jesus. Or literally uh, taking the church and bringing them to trial and responsible for their death. Until one day, Jesus showed up on the road to Emmaus and said... You're mine. You belong to me. And I will show you how you will suffer for me. And even the point, the Christians in the towns, as you read through the book of Acts, they wouldn't go near him because they legitimately and rightfully so were worried that he would kill them. He was like, oh, I'm a Christian now. Oh, yeah, inside job. And you're going to, you know, the CIA, KGB kind of thing. No, no, we're not going near you. And they even tried to kill him. And Paul went from town to town and city to city and he suffered to bring the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we lay down our our revenge at the feet of Jesus and ask for his grace that we may obey him to seek the good of our enemy. Will you surrender your desire for revenge to Jesus? And then finally... Our third point is to look to Jesus. Surrender your revenge. Obey Jesus and seek the good of your enemy. Love them, as we'll see next week. And then finally, look to Jesus. Jesus died to save his enemies. You know who his enemies were? All who belong to Jesus now. Christians, 
were born into the kingdom of darkness. The scripture says before Christ we were enemies. Our Satan was our master. We were uh, followed the way of the world. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love for us, while we were still dead in our sin, Christ died for us. Jesus died to save his enemies. He laid down his life to save those who hated him. Those who cried crucified him. Those who plotted his death. Those who lied about him. Those who betrayed and denied him. Those who mocked him and as he died. Those who nailed his hand and feet. And what did Jesus pray? Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they're doing. They were fully responsible for what they were doing. But they had no idea they were murdering their only means of salvation... And what they intended for evil, God intended it for good. And so in Tenenbrae, when we see, were you there when they crucified my Lord? We sometimes think of with Mary and Joanna as they stood behind, beside Jesus. But usually it means, were you there with the Romans passing them the hammer that nailed in the, hands, the nails into the hands of Jesus? Jesus is not asking any of us to do anything he has not already done himself. We can trust him. We can obey him. We can imitate him. Pray that the Lord would change your heart towards your enemy, that you may love them the way Christ has loved you while you were yet an enemy. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter. Um, I think it's page 115. It's what we read in the New Testament reading this morning. Page 115, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 25. If it's not the right page, you can go to your table of contents. Uh, uh, and the, right in the front, they have the New Testament. And then towards the end of the New Testament, there's First and Second Peter. And you can see what page number that is. It's First Peter chapter 2. Verses 20 through 25. Peter says this. What credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it and you endure? Often we suffer because we've done wrong. They're not persecuting you. You're just a jerk and you're getting the backlash of everybody coming at you. You're suffering because you opened your fat mouth again you shouldn't have. God told you, don't do that. And you did it, and now you're suffering because of it. But here, he's talking to those who have genuine injustices done to them. But if when you do good, and you suffer for it, uh, uh, suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Notice what it says, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you. The truth of the gospel is that God didn't leave us in the brokenness of the world. He entered into the brokenness and he felt the brokenness and the suffering in our weakness. And he actually endured more of the brokenness because he never uh, relinquished and never gave in. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. He did not seek revenge. But he continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly, to the Father. He himself bore our sin in the body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. Usher Mark, if you belong to Jesus, when you are called to suffer a little while or a long time, in different seasons. Revenge is not an option. Revenge will destroy you and keep piling sin on sin upon sin and harden your heart. However, know that you don't have the strength to seek the good of your enemy and to love your enemy, but Jesus does, and he will give you the grace that you need to do what is naturally impossible. When your heart stirs with hatred for legitimate sins, folks. This is not for like, oh, they clog the copier machine or something silly. Like legitimate sins. When your heart stirs with hatred, look to Jesus for love. When you only feel despair in that situation, look to Jesus for joy. 
When your heart is restless, look to Jesus for peace. When you're irritable and short, look to Jesus for patience. When your heart is cold, cry out to Jesus for kindness. When you crave vengeance, look to Jesus to teach you goodness. When you're disobedient, look to Jesus to teach uh, for the strength to be faithful. When you're rude and heavy-handed, uh, look to Jesus for gentleness. When you're unstable and agitated, look to Jesus for self-control. Jesus walked the path of no resistance. He is Lord of all creation, for whom and by through whom all things were created. Yet he humbled himself and came into his creation and was even held in the arms of his creation to die for his enemies as they mock and spit and reviled him on a cross which history has said was the most ruthless way to die. He laid down his rights as Lord of creation, King of kings and Lord of lords to bring you into his kingdom. And he tells us in Matthew chapter 5, do not resist the evil one. Turn the other cheek. Walk the extra mile. Let them have your cloak. Give to the other who begs. Is it because he wants feeble, weak followers? No, because he knows that there are far better things to lose than your reputation, your comfort, and your financial security. He knows revenge will cause you to lose your soul. Let go of revenge and retaliation. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And seek to be Christ-like. Ask for his strength. Imitate Jesus, knowing that by the power that is in you, you can um, be a people of his kingdom, not seeking revenge, but giving grace. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Father, we know too well a heart that seeks revenge and wants to punish the other person like they have hurt us. And I pray that we would surrender to Christ, repent and believe, obey Jesus, model Christ-likeness by seeking the good of our enemy and that we would look to Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, for who, what joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And Father, may we not relish in the shame of revenge, but look to the joy of eternity when all will be made right and we will always be with the Lord. Many tribes, one lamb, and no tears. Christ's precious and holy name we pray. Amen.